I am Nairi Woods, Dean of the School of Government. And it's a huge pleasure tonight to welcome back to the school um, Idris Jala. Um, Idris was CEO for um, a period of, I think, three years of Malaysian Airlines before taking on the job of building a delivery unit, or Pemandu. You don't call it a delivery unit. No, no exactly. Pemandu in the, in the government of Malaysia. And Idris, it's a, such a pleasure to have you here this evening. Idris, we'll start with <clears throat> a brief presentation of the six secrets of transformational leadership, which are the six secrets you've come here to, to learn about. And then we'll move directly into questions. So, Idris, with no further ado, thank you so much, and it's such a pleasure to welcome you back to the school. Thank you. <clears throat> I have some slides that I would like to take you through, and if you don't mind, I, I will probably stand here. <clears throat> um, that guy on, on your left was my late father, and he looked really like that. And uh, if you look very closely at the photograph, on your right, you see some human skulls there. My ancestors used to chop people's head. They were head hunters. I'm okay, by the way. <clears throat> yeah. So the next picture is that the long house that I was born and bred, and I, I was born and bred in the jungle of Borneo. That's how it looked like, and slightly better today than it was before. So actually, I came from a very, very interesting background. And I am here simply because of education. If not for education, I am a fervent believer that education is the ultimate answer for poverty. <clears throat> so I leave that for now, and I want to talk about this idea for, of transformation. I, I use three words to describe transformation, because transformation to me is about making sure that you have a fundamental, a whole system change. There are two, two types of leaders, people who look at this in this yin-yang chart. If you are looking at it from the red uh, side, you want to make changes today that will affect results now. But if you are standing on the young side, that means you want to fundamentally make changes in the being of the organization, but changes, the results is going to take a long time to come. And I give you a layman's example. If, how many people know how to ride a bicycle here? Most of you do, and some they didn't put up their hands. Imagine I brought you to the school that's called the Blue School of Riding Bicycle and I teach you the physics of motion for seven years to get a PhD. And I give you a bicycle, you still don't know how to ride it. The School of Red is about just giving you the bicycle. You go on it and you fall a few times and somehow you wreck a bang, you figure it out. And so that's the two difference. And so we're not saying one is wrong or right, but if you want big fast results, you've got to stand in the red. Actually, much of what I do in my work today, I make no pretense that my work and the teams that I, I, I lead today is focusing on the red rather than the blue. I'm not arguing the blue is wrong. It is also right, but it takes a long time. Let me talk about the six secrets, how to get big, fast results. If you come to Malaysia, my, my car's number plate is BFR big fast results and I believe in this. The first thing I always tell people is that it's called the game of the impossible. If you want to go through transformation, my view is that most of us will die underground and get buried underground, not fulfilling our full potential because of the fear of failure. Who would dare to go on CNN tomorrow and say he will be the next 100 meters Olympics champion of the world in this room? Any takers? Why is nobody putting up their hands? Fear of failure. That is the reason. Actually, unfortunately, the problem today is this. Because of the constant fear of failure, we actually go out in life doing only the things that we think we can do. And therefore, we never push ourselves to the limits. Let's suppose, I'm going to abuse Ian. We worked together in Shell before simply because I know him. If Ian was crazy enough to go to CNN and say he'll be the next 100 meters Olympics champion of the world, people would laugh. Let's say he wakes up in the morning at 7 o'clock and practices for eight hours a day. Every day he does it for four years. Comes to the Olympic Games. How many people in this room believe that Ian will be the 100 meters Olympics champion of the world? They're very honest people here. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you live today, uh, Ian? 
in Warwick. Wow. That's where I studied for my master's degree. How many people in this room believe that for four years he runs every day and practice that he will be the champion in Warwick? Some people do, and there's still very many honest people. Now I want to leave the point here. It doesn't matter whether Ian becomes the Olympic champion of the world or whether he's the champion in Warwick. What matters is because he conquered the fear of failure, he undertook this game of the impossible. In four years, the man is transformed. No one in this room would be fitter, more fit than than Ian, because he took that journey. So I just want to leave the message that if you want to pursue this game of transformational leadership, you want to transform yourself and deliver big outcomes, you must conquer the fear of failure first and foremost. And winning is not the main criteria. Winning is not the main criteria. It's the journey that you take. That is the thing that will transform you. You cannot transform an organization unless you are prepared to be transformed. And that is why I always believe in doing this. So the Olympics target setting at conquering the fear of failure. And it must be so big. I call it the game, the impossible. If I undertake it, everybody must say you're going to fail doing it. Your girlfriend or your husband or your... Your, your wife will say you're definitely going to fail. If they say you're going to fail, that's exactly why you needed it. Because if you fail, it's okay. Since they said you couldn't do it anyway. That is, that is the thing. Next slide, please. When I was working with Ian, you know, after I left, I was vice president for retail consultancy. We had a team of people in Shell, down, Shell worldwide, whose job was is to go to many, many countries to fix the problem in Shell. And we were in the team, there were about 60 of us, that we flew to, to Manila, we were in Calgary, we were in wherever to fix the problem in our operating companies. That was what we were doing. I was asked by the boss, he said, Idris, since you know how to fix companies, you tell our operating companies, why don't you go back to Malaysia, we have a Shell company that lose money for 10 straight years. You go and fix it. If you cannot fix it, then we close it. I remember turning up in Malaysia, had to do this, and we had 10 years of constant losses. And I told everybody, we had our first day, and I had a town hall session like this with the staff. And I said to the guys, we're going to make money here. And they don't believe. There was one guy who put up his hands. He's a Dutchman. He said, I'm going to put a wager with you, Idris. You will never make a profit here because your predecessor talked like you. And if you make a profit, I'll give you 100 ringgit. That's a small amount of money. That's 30 US dollars. These are Dutchmen, their wages are very small. <clears throat> They're not, they don't make big bets. But he actually lost the bet in six months. And we, we broke even in, the, in six months. In the subsequent year, we made record profit. That's nearly 100 million US dollars net profit. In the second year, uh, the third year, we made 500 million ringgit. That is, we paid our debts. Actually, we had no more debt. We paid it. Some of you may follow. We were the only company in the world that produced gas to liquids at that time. That means the Germans came uh, with the Fischer-Tropp's technology was that we could take natural gas and convert them into kerosene and to diesel. The cost of producing that was uh, very expensive. The, the diesel was so pure you could drink it if you wanted to, but we didn't advise you. It's non-toxic, and so there was the kerosene. But so if you sold it at the price as a kerosene or the diesel, you'll never make money because the cost to produce was so punitive. So we were creating crazy stuff. What did we do with our kerosene? We sold them as barbecue lighter in Australia because the Aussies love barbecue. And the point was the kerosene has no, no smell because there's no soot to it. It's non-toxic. So we said to them, the value proposition is, if you can put the barbecue lighter there, you can put the chicken straight away. It's okay. And so, but the Aussies, the company called Red Hat, they said to me, Idris, we will buy it from you, provided you do not put the name made in Malaysia. I said to him, okay, if you pay me double or triple the price, it's okay. 
So if you go to Coles Meyer stores in the whole of Australia, you see this brand called Red Hat, you will never see made in Malaysia there. <coughs> but we started to make money, and that's was a very, and we made the most audacious target that we wanted to be the official supplier of, of green fuel at Athens Olympics in, in, that, in that year. People say, you mad, Idris, there's no way you can ship our products all the way from Bintulu, from Malaysia, and compete with all the refineries in Europe and beat them. Actually, we did win it. We were the official supplier for green fuels in the Athens Olympics in 2004, actually. And as a result of all this, anybody have known about GTL in Qatar? That's why Shell invested 10 times the size to build the gas to liquids in Qatar because of the success of what has happened here. But you know, I, I tell you this story simply because it's about the game of the impossible. When I joined the government, the Prime Minister said to me, look Idris, we need to have a lot of investment. And the target was we need to raise a total of two or four hundred and five hundred or four hundred billion US dollars of investments over a period of uh, very short period of time, identify them within one year and increase our gross national income to the tune of 250 billion US dollars and create 3.3 million jobs. It was a crazy idea. How do you possibly do that? So what we did was we gathered 500 Malaysians all across various sectors, plus the government people, and we call it labs. And we locked them in the room for eight straight weeks. And the motto for the labs was Hotel California. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave until you come with the projects and the investments that is required to run our, our country. It was phenomenal. I think it was one of the most interesting experiments that we had to, to conduct in Malaysia. 131 projects were put out by all the companies in Malaysia, the big companies, and uh, the total investment was 406 billion that, uh, that they, they promised, and the jobs were there. It was actually in that time that uh, Bloomberg put me as among the top 10 most influential policy makers in the world. I did ask them why. Why not Obama? <laughs> why not my boss? And the comment they said was, we don't put people with authority on the list because they had authority. Of course, they could use the authority. But I didn't have authority. But our methodology was putting a large group of people in the room they called the labs to come with solutions that will provide the impetus to put our economy on the right, on, on right keel. So next slide, please. So that is the first thing. So you really have to deal with this subject of conquering the fear of failure. I want to leave that, that point for now and I move to the second secret. If you want to move, it's no good saying you want to have the game the impossible without knowing what is true north. I want to introduce this term called true north. If you are in running a company that loses a lot of money, clearly the true north is to make sure you cut your losses, you make a profit. So that's true north. And if you are running an organ a, 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 a country where there's very high crime rates, the true north must be to bring down crime data. And so you need to identify the true north. Why is that important? Because if you haven't got your head around that, you cannot do prioritization. I, I use the term ruthless prioritization because the problem with life is life is full of trade-offs. And unfortunately, everybody says this is priority, that's also a priority, and that's priority. But nobody really come down and say, look, really, actually life is a trade-off. I have to say this is a priority. I am not going to do that. In fact, I suggest to people, rather than say this is my priority, maybe we should begin by saying this is not my priority. And I, have, in my life, I only believe that people will only know what is true prioritization if they really spend time really understanding true north, the measure of success. And I always tell people, if you haven't figured out your true measure of success, you cannot do prioritization. Much of the fault in many governments today is that they get into so much debt. The British government debt is around 89% of GDP. 
UK, US debt is 104%. Japan is worth 226% of GDP. Greece is not as bad as Japan, 176%. Why is that so? Because the governments want to do everything under the sun. They haven't identified the true north, and therefore everything is important. There's not enough money for everything. You end up having to borrow. That is the problem. So I think this is key. After I finished the job that I described, they were, they, the prime minister called me. He said, uh, Idris, you did a good job in Shell. We have this company that lose so much money called Malaysia Airlines. We had two and a half months of cash. So I became the CEO on the 1st of December 2005. This was on the front page of the newspaper. I was a little younger at the time. That means in two and a half months, if we didn't change the way in which we were running, in two and a half months, no money for salary. No money for fuel, so you have to ground the aircraft. And the comment from the prime minister, the very next day when he introduced me to the public, that I was the new CEO, he said, the government will not bail you out. If you guys don't fix your problem, then you're dead. That was the headline the subsequent day. So when I told everybody that I was going to do this job, everybody said, you're going to fail doing this. He said, it's OK, because everybody said I couldn't do it. I had to conquer the fear of failure. So I knew that the true north was to turn around the company. So I was very, very simple in my view. If I deal with a company that lose money, I have only one thing that I begin doing. I decompose the profit and loss statement into the lowest common denominator. So in the case of Malaysia Alliance, we have 110,000 flights in a year. I insisted I wanted to have profit and loss statement for every flight. That means the moment the flight takes off from Kuala Lumpur and lands in London, I want to know an hour after that how much money did we make on that flight, how much did we lose on that flight. It's like the playing in the English Premier League. You become the champion if you win most of the matches. Running airlines is exactly like that. On one day, you make money. On that flight, the next day, you lose money because of how you sell the seats. So what did we do? After we did that, we found how many routes were lo making losses. Then we locked people in the labs. So we get the guys who are, we used to fly to Manchester, by the way, from Kuala Lumpur. And we were losing so much money, we got all the staff that were looking after that route to Kuala Lumpur to Manchester, and we got them into the room. In two weeks in the lab, they concluded, boss, we cannot turn around this airline. This route cannot be done. The break-even load factor was 140% to break-even. That means I need to take 40% additional passengers, tie them on the wings of the aircraft, and then with that yield, then we will break even. It was impossible. So when we did that, it was the staff that said it cannot be fixed, and they said we need to close it. And they accepted the redundancies because it couldn't be fixed. So we got rid of unprofitable routes. We then, that means in the first year that I was there, we nearly broke even. In the second year, we made the highest profit in our 60-year history. In the subsequent years, even when we had the financial crisis, at the time when oil price was uh, uh, $100 a barrel, there were only 95% of the airlines in the world were losing money. Malaysia Airlines still made money, actually, at that time. So I am of the view that if you understand what is the true north, in our case, turning around the company, decomposed the lowest common denominator. So if you, any one of you run businesses, my panacea is decompose the PNL to the lowest common denominator. We just did some work for an, a university in Malaysia. They wanted to double their profitability. So I told them, why don't we create profit and loss statement for every program? So we got everybody in the room, and we found out they were making so much money from architecture they didn't know it. And they were not giving them enough space to grow. They were making a lot of losses in pharmacy, but they were growing that one. It was so simple, but nobody understood that. Only when we came out and looked at the data, it became very obvious which were the ones, the programs that were so much opportunity for growth, 
high fees that people are prepared to pay, and it made much more sense to grow there rather than that. But it was very difficult to do because if you are the dean in a particular uh, program that you have to go in because you're not making money there, that's why I mean by pro prioritization, focus on the things that really matter. And why was that important? Because the true north was profit and loss statement. That was what it was all about. If you're clear about that, then you know where the measures are. Let me talk about the third one. It's called the discipline of action. So if you said you are going to do that stuff, I, def I, I caught people in the room, getting everybody in the room to work together to come with the solutions at detail. My biggest criticism of many consultants, of many governments, is that they come up with strategies at 30,000 feet. They don't bring them down to nitty gritty at three feet. That is why I cannot deliver. And I always tell people, if I don't see your work detailed to three feet, I have no confidence you will deliver it. Can you ever imagine you want to build a house? You have a conceptual design. You spend one day sketching the, the house but no detailed design, no architectural design, no mechanical drawing, etc. You cannot build that house. So therefore, I am a believer that discipline only comes when you have this language called three feet, not 30,000 feet. I use the term because when I was in the airlines, I could use a term that they understand. You know, when you fly a plane, normal cruising speed is 30,000 feet. When you want to land, you must bring it down there. That's why the language was like that. And so the other thing is that about discipline, you must monitor. In Malaysia, we have monitoring mechanism for all of our initiatives every Friday at 5 o'clock. I insist that every Friday at 5 o'clock, there's a report on the iPad. And BlackBerry last time when it was there, it's uh, going off soon, I think. And so um, we need to tell people, have you delivered or not delivered on Friday? Why on Friday? Because we can spoil the weekend when it's red. So because on the internet, we will send the minister. I remember the, minister, the prime minister sent a note to one minister and said, you are supposed to do that last week. I saw it was red. And this week is still red. What are you and your staff going to do differently on Monday so that on Friday it becomes green? All hell broke loose on the weekend because they started to figure out what they're going to do differently. So discipline, action. So I'm, I'm not going, i just give another example. If you ever, some of you want to build, learn how to do things quickly, we have a program in Malaysia called Building a House in Three Days. It's purely for charity. And the first time I got my team to go and build this house, many of them, you can see there, they've never touched hammer in their life. <laughs> Many of them came with high heels when we went there on a, on, a, on a Friday, with lipsticks as well, some of the ladies. I can tell you, the guy who's over in the picture, Mr. Johnson, the guy on the very, the very far right here, he spent time explaining to them exactly what are you going to do, how to cut, and teach them what to do. And after he did tell you what to do, and you are supposed to tell everybody else in front of him, what did he say to you? 70% of them get it wrong. You must tell exactly the same thing, and then they say, okay, now pass. Because if you cannot say the same thing as he told you, the chances are you cannot be team leader. So everybody must know it. And so when we build this house, we were able to build it in three days, actually, that house that was built there. And the guy next to me is the beneficiary of that house when we finish doing it. It costs only 10, 000, uh, 20,000 US dollars to build a house like that for charity. Um, discipline, being like this is the thing we're doing in Malaysia to cut our fiscal deficit because we were having such a huge fiscal deficit. So every year we have to do it, and you have to keep on plugging at it. Let me talk now about the fourth secret. It's called situational leadership. Some of you may have read about, about this, the Blanchard model. I, I always believe that when you start a journey on transformation, Blanchard, I really like his approach. Because he says, when you begin a journey, 
your style as a leader need to be directive. You can listen to people, but when they tell you they don't agree, for example, when you wanted to build this building here, it looks architecturally different from the rest. There'll be a resistance from the conservatives to say, how dare you have an architecture that look incongruous to the rest of the building. But if you believe it's the right thing to do, you hear them, but you still do it. That is what is called uh, directive style. Moses, when he took his people out from Egypt, uh, from, from Egypt to the Promised Land, do you think he had a democratic discussion with his people? <laughs> There's no GPS, you know, at the time. But he had to look at them and say, look, this is where we're going. And they believe him. Because it took a long time, 40 years in the desert is a bloody long time. And so when you go through this, there will be a period there will be, they don't like the work. It's, it's called the dissatisfaction phase. You're still directive. But in the phase where the team become good at what they're doing, they become competent, they solve the problem, they can produce. It's called the production phase. By the way, we leave copies of this with the school, so you find one way or another you can get them. Then you must change your repertoire. You cannot continue to be directive. You need to be empowering. You need to learn to let go. Some of the management schools will tell you the only way for leadership to work is to be empowering. I don't think that is right. Can you imagine you have your small child, your babies in when you are, and then you say you're empowered to go to the kitchen and do whatever you like with the knives there. You go to the fireplace, please go, you're empowered. You cannot, actually for incompetent people, the answer is no and don't. You give them prescribed things to do. But when they grow older, you have to learn to let go. You must become redundant. This is where empowerment exists. Learning to let go. The problem with most leadership is that many of us are either directing or empowering. We're not ambidextrous. So when we become good at leadership, we must be ambidextrous. We must know when to be directive, when to be empowering in our approach. And this is my biggest criticism of modern day leadership being so monotonous in the approach rather than being ambidextrous. The fifth secret is about winning coalition. That means bringing people along with you, being able to energize people, being able to get them along because no leader is a leader without followers. And by the way, even when you have to win them, you have to win the hearts and minds even for those that will resist you. Marty Linsky, that I, actually I do speak at, Oxford, at Harvard as well, twice a year, and I usually, he's speaking before me, and he used this term, transformational leadership is about disappointing people at the rate they'll permit you to. And I, it takes me a long time to think it through. He said, you're gonna make them very angry with you, but you have to make them understand why you have to do some of those difficult measures. But you will disappoint them. But you have to win them over with you to explain to them. But you don't, you don't just bulldoze your way through without giving reason, engaging them. Because you still want them, they will be disappointed, but they will accept the decisions that you are taking. So bringing and taking people along with you. When we run labs, it's about winning coalition. Getting people to come along with you. Inspiring people. I'm going to pass this. Actually, maybe I stick for a while. I was in Sri Lanka in my, one of my job in, in Shell. It was one of the most challenging job I had in Shell, Sri Lanka. They had planted bomb underneath our sphere because during the time of the Tamil Tigers. If the bomb had detonated behind, underneath that sphere, 1,800 metric tons of gas, people that would have lived within four kilometer radius would have died. They took my transport manager hostage. I had to go with one truckload of soldiers and one truckload of police to go and rescue him. There is nothing in the shell manual that tells me how to do this problem. And so, honestly, I, I was on my knees figuring out what to do with this. The only solution to move forward, we had strikes almost every, every day. In fact, they had, at that time, we had to raise the price of LPG so high up the market that people were complaining. 
that I have to win the hearts and minds of my staff, the union, and the people because we were monopoly. That's the problem, monopoly, yeah? You cannot raise prices because everybody's up in arms. They put a photograph of me sitting on an LPG rocket, the lie within Shell. And so it was very, very tough. My wife actually had a panic attack during that time when we were there, so she had to go home. I was staying all alone by myself. Really, I mean, asking, what am I doing here? I nearly left Shell at the time, actually, Ian. I was close to quitting. But, you know, I had to persevere. But the solution in the end was winning collision, bringing people along, explaining to them why we needed to do it. It was painful, but communication is absolutely important. I basically told the staff, if we don't do what we have to do here, and I will be honest to you that in one year from today, we'll close this plant, everybody will be redundant. I'll be the last to switch off the lights. So either you work with me to make it work, or we have no other choice to close the plant. In fact, I said to them, look, I'm on the verge of giving up. Sometimes you have to talk tough messages like that because it was very, very difficult. Let me talk about the last secret. And this is what they don't teach you, I'm sure, in Harvard Business School and uh, in uh, Blavatnik School of Government, this idea of divine intervention. And I, I really believe this to be true, you know. There are two human paradigms. One is we don't control everything that happens to us. I have always, my ambition in life was to be a, a lawyer. I wanted to be a lawyer, so I worked very hard, and I, and I got a scholarship to do law in New Zealand. And I was supposed to go to Auckland University. And unfortunately, because I come from the jungle of Borneo, I told them, if you give me the offer, send it to my auntie who's holidaying in Europe. Unfortunately, she, by the time she came back, the offer letter was misplaced, so I never went there. So I ended up going to Penang. If I didn't go to Penang, I would not have met my wife. And if I didn't go there, there's no Max and Leon, our beautiful boys. And life would have changed so much for me. Actually, nine, more than 80% of what happened to me had very little to do with me in my life. If you don't believe me, tonight I ask you to do one simple exercise. List down all the major things that happened to you and put a tick if they happen exactly the way they did because you caused them to happen. Put a cross if it didn't happen the way you caused it to happen. And you count the numbers. I tell you, most of them will be crosses. The second paradigm is that life is a continuous reduction of options. This is what I mean. When we were young, Everything in the morning you say, yeah, I want to be a pilot. The same afternoon you say you want to be a rock star. You want to be a billionaire. Everything is possible. But when you grow a little older, suddenly it's, mm, I'm not very good in mathematics. Cannot be a medical doctor. Cannot be an engineer. Then you go to, uh, you apply for, uh, to, uh, to do a course. You can't do 10 courses because the world tells you only one at a time. You come, you, you got to work, you can't work in 10 companies, only one. When you get married, also option reduced. So many, many things option reduced. So I've always pondered about life. If these two paradigms says that most of what happens to us, very little to do with us, and uh, as we grow older, options to reduce, life is actually a very boring thing, you know, because suddenly you, you're stuck there. What do you do to make these things come in your favor? Some of you might have read Paulo Coelho in the book, The Alchemist. He says, if you want something desperately, the whole universe will conspire to make it happen. And I really believe in that philosophy. And so I do three things I suggest. If you are a good transformational leader, first and foremost, you must be a good human being. And you have to do the random act of kindness. If you have more money, have do some charitable work. And just be a good human being on ethics. Many, many things happen in life that's not right, not wrong, but not legal, not illegal, but they are gray in the middle. This is about our conscience. What do you do? What are the decisions you take that are ethical? And finally, self-renewal. Self-renewal is about 
regular thing that you need to do in my view and let me talk about ethics in my experience I always find if I have to do anything that's gray my advice never make decision on your own get a group of people particularly if you're a management team get the whole management team involved get the facts on the table so that you make collective decision and write down on a piece of paper all the facts pertaining in that case why you chose option two rather than one and leave give yourself the litmus test if this document get leaked into the public domain are you okay for it to be leaked if you say I'm not okay for it to be leaked then your decision is not okay this is a very important test because if you did make decisions alone by yourself over time your conscience get modified when your conscience get modified what used to be white what used to be black become gray what used to be gray become white and over time you progress to do things that are actually illegal and corrupt and lastly renewal renewal self renewal is we all busy running around doing all sorts of things you know I always urge people to go away quietly at least once a week sit quietly and nobody disturb you and ask the fundamental question what am I doing wrong and right in the way I am leading the team in the way I'm engaging myself with the public because you know if you don't look at yourself in the mirror you will never make corrections and so this repeated practice of looking at yourself in the mirror is a very important thing for renewal self renewal and I, I'd like to close by saying I want to give you an invitation today if you want to go and take this path called transformational leadership if you begin by choosing your own game the impossible identify what it is today and you need to conquer the fear of failure and you need to identify your true north so that you can then have the discipline of action every day you're going to do what you said you were going to do then you understand how you have to lead the team beginning you need to be directive and later on you need to be empowering letting the, the, the guys run with it bringing people along with you and lastly humility because the world is not at your feet that's where the divine intervention you can do number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five, and actually still fail. Because it's not meant to be. The mindset of transformational leaders are those that accept vulnerability as a virtue. You must be prepared to be vulnerable. You cannot come out and tell everybody that the world is at your feet. And if you come out and say the world is at your feet, you think it's infallible. That's when pride sets in. Humility is a very important component. It's also important when you know the troops, people working for you, they do their best and they don't <coughs> deliver results. Do not shoot them. Because it can happen to you too. And that's why I think I live with this very simple notion that if you like, the game, the impossible, and the divine intervention is a countervailing. It's an interplay, it's a trade-off between them. And my invitation today is that if you imbue this and you run with this, you'll make a fundamental, first of all, step change in your own transformation. And hopefully the outcome would be you'll get the results that you want. It may not come. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, um, Idris. There's a lot of um, psychologists that now work in behavioral science to show the effect of aspiration on performance. And the kind of inspiration you give to people, I think, has a measurable impact on their aspiration. Thank you. Your questions, comments. Aida. Yep. Um, There's just a microphone coming. Yeah. Do introduce yourselves. Say who you are, where you're from. Hello. Um, it's working. Is, 
it's working. Um, Aida from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, we had the pleasure to yeah. meet you just before. Um, one question that has appeared to me while you were uh, holding your lecture was, um, what about um, leadership and diversity, especially in countries where you have like so many diverse groups of people? I don't know, we have a group of 100 25 students coming from 70 countries, and we always come across this question, how to um, manage leadership of diversity. Thank you. Diversity is a very important agenda. And when I talked about labs earlier on, I used the labs as a tool to bring diverse groups of people inside the room to come with solutions. When I talk about diversity, it isn't just a physical attribute, not just gender diversity, but that's important, religious and other. But I think more importantly is diverse way of thinking, diverse ways of relating with one another, diverse ways of communicating. So diverse ways of thinking, the, ways, the way you relate to people and the way in which you communicate and do things. And if you can get that, that's how you form a winning team. I mean, we all know I, I'm a fan of football, you know. Leicester, last season, very ordinary team. They became champion because they were able to pull the team together. But the leadership role is also very important. So I, I really believe that when you put a winning team, you have good guys who are defenders, good guys who are out there running in defense, and the fellows who are supposed to attack. You, know, you need a diverse team of people. The huge data in Malaysia, we put a target in two years that we want to have 30% women at least in decision-making uh, roles in, in Malaysia at CEO minus one. And so we put it as a target. It's very tough because we are using what you call uh, an, an attempt that's voluntary. In Scandinavia, they've said if you're a publicly listed company, you don't comply, you're delisted. But we have said to the public, we are not going to do that just yet. But if they don't do it, we may actually, as a country, adopt such measures because we believe diversity is very, very important. Would you actually say that that could be also applied to countries where you had actually wars because of diversity and not being able to manage? I mean, that's one of the uh, research areas that also our school deals with, post yeah. I agree, agree with you. I mean, totally agree. But I think diversity is a very important component. You can't have half the world not really involved in, in, in the endeavor when you talk about women and also etc. We, we, we did some labs in Oman. I tell you, I, I, was, I tell you a story. I, I, I was invited to Riyadh and I had a crowd like this and I spoke at the forum. And then I had meetings with some ministers they will have dinner. I had forgotten I was in Riyadh. So I asked the question to the minister that was there, where are the women? You could hear a pin drop because it's not a question to ask. There was not a woman in any of the three forums I was involved in. It's a fundamental issue that they have to grapple with to involve much more women in various endeavors. But in, in Oman, we ran the labs there. That there are a lot of women involved in the labs in Oman. Quite different. Can I, can I follow up? Because I, I don't know how many people in the room have actually followed the, the labs and what they do. But what's very striking is the way that your labs take the people who are, in, who, who are the people who implement and get them to find solutions. Right. So it's really getting the implementers to find yeah. their own solutions. And that's very, very different to calling in consultants Absolutely. and having consultants define the solutions. Yeah. Um, but you're a consultant now, so tell me, how does that work? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, everywhere I go, I will never tell them I'm a consultant. Right. The term I use to describe my team, we are facilitators. Mm -hmm. Because when we bring people in the room, we bring the guys in the room to uh, implementing it, we help them with a framework so that they discover the solution. Mm -hmm. They do the analysis they come with the solutions inside the room together. Because A, it gives so much ownership with the solution is from them. And because they have the ownership, they have commitment to deliver it. And so when we are consulting in Oman, I always say my team are not consultants. We don't come and tell you how to do it. Although in Malaysia we've done X, N, Y, and Z, we all bring the tools only. 
we will share with you the tool, but we will not give you the answer. But the labs is the one that provide the answer. So the, the term delivery unit that people talked about, to my mind, is a misnomer. Because delivery units do not deliver. It's the ministries in the government that deliver. So the delivery units are catalysts. People who bring in a new way for them to interact, to come out to do it. So I will always tell my team, even if you think we know the answers, we cannot prescribe the answers to them. We would want them to come with the solutions themselves inside the labs. Thank you. Uh, next question. Yeah. Lisa. Lisa from Ukraine. Um, I want to ask, what, are, what is the role of the media in conveying actually that messages of en encouraging people like for uh, short term, uh, yeah, achieving short term goals? Uh, and uh, also, um, I wonder if what are the other tools as uh, in Malaysian experience as social media did you use for actually promoting this all? approach. <laughs> yeah. If you ask me which is the area of weakness that we have, the weakest link in our work, it's communication. And uh, we tried many things, I would say. I even, first two years when I, we were there, we did quite a lot of things, but they were quite poorly done in my view, if I look at our work. We book spaces in the media, we print every two weeks the outcome and the results, nobody read them. We put infographics. People don't like to look at that too. There, there was a time, I think two years ago, I decided to hold a rock concert. I invited 70,000 people to come there to watch the concert. We had the, 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 the best Malaysian Chinese uh, singer. And then she sang the song. And then after that, we have intermission to tell them about our crime initiative. <laughs> Then we have the in Malaysian Indian, he came out in the Rashmanu, we come and did that. Then we told them about the urban public transport. But nobody was listening. <laughs> so it was so hard. I mean, these are boring stuff that we did. But that didn't work too. So the other thing that we did is every time we have the Prime Minister giving us, like the State of the Union address, our report card, we make him speak immediately after prime time news. But, you know, people switch off and watch other things. And so I would say on social media, I'm on Twitter, we put all sorts of things. I go on air, on radio, we answer questions from public. I actually find that one very effective. And we had a series called We Are The Government. Okay, that means the people are the government. So I ask for our guys to sit there and man the radio station. If you have any question from the public, call now and answer now, live. And that really puts you on the spot. But unless you are really confident about your answers, you got nailed on radio. And so to be prepared to be vulnerable, you must go out and say, if I don't know the answer, say you don't know it. But it's not many ministers prepared to go out on air and say, I pick up the answers live and answer whatever I can, and I will say it. What I cannot, I'll say I cannot. And so these are very tough. I would say today, if you ask me from all our work, which has this, the lowest score is communication. You can never do enough. And so our document for our blueprint, for the average Malaysians, we write 601 page plan. Nobody read it. Then we had an executive summary for the lazy Malaysian, 50 pages, only 20% read. Then we have the, the very lazy Malaysians, six minute video. They don't have to read it, but they, they don't read it. They don't watch the video too. So you can get really despondent on, on communication. So I would say today, in, in today's day and age, it's a huge challenge with so much information loading out there. Getting your messages out is a very tough thing. But Idris, could I just ask you, given that you're on the issue of leadership, yeah. if there isn't a tension between the leader who is, com is using media constantly to communicate and the leader who's actually really empowering people to find solutions and work through labs. Because what I see 
is that the, in, in, in government, is that the leader who's constantly focused outward on the media yeah. is often trying to front run their team. Sure. They're often trying to take all credit yeah. for solutions. It's very disempowering yes, true. to the people who are actually trying Doing to come up with solution and implement. Yes, and isn't there a tension between those two? I agree, I agree. And, and so how is it that if you could, you would want to use the media in order to, 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 to do the transformational leadership? Because I could say to you, well, maybe it's best not to have any media attention mm. precisely so that you can actually, Focus. the team can focus and, yeah. and lead, but what, why would you, what is it, what is your ideal? Yeah. That's exactly the conversation we're having back home, actually. My team and I are having numerous debates. Mm -hmm. Some of the gung-ho people in my team, they want to jump and defend every little thing. And there's some that says, leave it alone. Let's let us focus on our work. I don't know the answer, to be very honest with you, Henry, because as I said, this is our weakness. Mm -hmm. It's so hard, and we do certain things, we think it's going to work, but it doesn't really quite work. Mm -hmm. But I do know that the outcomes, what we're doing, we're delivering those results. Mm -hmm. And so, but you know, we are very polarized, like you see in the, the States today. Half of the Americans are on this side, and the other half is here. In Malaysia, it's much similar too. Mm -hmm. So I think whatever you do, the one half is not going to believe everything the government is doing. Mm -hmm. So if you try to persuade them to change their mind, they will not be persuaded. They're only interested in a change of government. And Idris, what percentage of what your government says it's doing do you believe? <laughs> the things that we're doing, I would say here, this is what we said we would do, this we said we were not doing. Right, yeah. The ones we said we do and we deliver them, when we say we deliver them, I believe them. Mm -hmm. Because they're audited. Because we also say what we have not delivered in there. But these are the ones where we're not saying we're doing them. Whatever people say, is, uh, I have to look at the evidence to say I'm, I believe them. Right, right. Very good. Uh, yes, Ade. Uh, my name is Ade. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, thank you so much for your insight. Um, I'm just uh, curious to know two things. You know, one could possibly say that in your two um, different careers in, in the private sector and the government that you've been on a winning yeah. streak. Um, so I'm just curious to know the things that you've actually failed at, you know, the things that you consider failure uh, professionally and what are the biggest learning points from those failures. That's one. Uh, and the second one is about your in transitioning from the private sector to um, to, to government, to the public sector, you know, how did you resolve those initial concerns about lending your, uh, lending the government legitimacy? Because that's what I tend to, what, what tends to happen in most countries where uh, the government has a credibility issue and they are trying to look for, um, you know, outsiders who can lend legitimacy to their government, you know. So how did you resolve those concerns? And then at what point would you advise a technocrat to pull out of a government? I know your country is currently facing, your president has a bit of credibility crisis over, like, you know, corruption scandal and all that. So at what point would you say a technocrat should pull out uh, of, of a government that has a credibility issue? Thank you. I think the, 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 the challenges that most government face in terms of uh, bringing in uh, private sector people inside there, it's like when you bring private sector people in the government, it's like a foreign object put in, in, the, in the body. There's, there's usually some rejections to it. And that is why I always say to my team, we don't come out and give solutions. We run the lab so that they come up with the solutions. The civil servants are cutting solutions. So if you don't do that, you really, really run into a problem. That's why I always tell people, let the solutions come from the people themselves inside the labs. And then the ownership is there. So then they embrace us. To the last question that you said about at which point do technocrats quit a government if there are a crisis? I think there are two things you need to look at. Uh, what's running in Malaysia, I, I, I'm, I'm talking about close to home. The fundamentals are very good. But then we have a huge perception problem in Malaysia coming out from the one MDB issue and, and allegations around corruption on political funding. And so our view today is that let the law run its course, let the investigations finish. The DOJ had come out with something. Let the DOJ come out with the evidence. We, they haven't come it out yet. We had a partisan team, non-partisan team that involved opposition party. They spent six, six months pouring through the evidence.
couldn't find any evidence to implicate my prime minister. So the rule of law must apply. So if you want to find anybody guilty, you must put the evidence clearly on the table and then on the basis of that move forward. That we have an election that's coming, which is uh, either this year or next year, latest. That's when the people vote. You know, election, the beauty about election is people will vote a prime minister or a government that they think shouldn't be there. And so I always believe that's why you have democracy. Election must is a beautiful way to make sure you get the right government to rule at the right time. But I guess, Idris, the question is partly, and it, and it affects a lot of uh, our students in the school, yeah. you know, your, your rule number two is about ethics, ethics and making decisions from the white. So if you want to go back to your own country, <coughs> and let's say you're from a country where there, there clearly is corruption in government, but you want to do good because the government is also doing some good. I see. What are the rules that you should give yourself before you go back home to take up that yeah, job? Because yeah. that's a question I'm asked a lot. Yeah, yeah, What's yeah. your answer to yeah. that? My, my answer is pretty simple. In the work that I do and my team does, we will never cross the line. Mm -hmm. Because I cannot go home mm -hmm. if I'm involved, personally involved in doing this. Mm -hmm. So we ran a lab on, on corruption in Malaysia. So we came up with a very clear recommendation of what we needed to do. There were three of them. Measures that we were taking on procurement corruption. Measures that we were going to take on regulatory corruption. So removing bureaucracies in order that the people don't get to bribe in order to get approval. And political funding. Mm -hmm. It was the last one that we have been unable to convince both political parties to institute. And the argument that I have today is if both of them have agreed we introduce reforms today mm -hmm. on political funding, what happened on 1MDB would have not happened. Because the lacuna in Malaysia, there's no law in Malaysia that regulate political funding today. Yep. Thank and that you. is the problem. And very last question, Marcus. Okay. Uh, a... Uh, I just wondered, I, when I read, the, when I was watching you mentioning this, the last point about divine intervention, I was wondering if you could tell us who inspires you and uh, if you have other leaders that you reflect upon, things that they have done, and how do you also convey this to the new generations who are coming along? How do you, because yeah. transformational leadership means also yeah. that you're going to prepare the next ones that are going to come along. How are you conveying that to them? Yeah, the first, I think my father put a lot of early childhood inspiration to me. Yeah? The game, the impossible, my dad has a very simple rule. He was a teacher when he became a chief of the village when he retired. He said, you know, son, if you want to be number one in class, it's very simple. Find out who is currently number one and be his or her best friend. <laughs> and ask him how many books he read, how many hours does he study. If he studies a day four hours, you do five hours, you do six hours, and what's the result? And keep doing that. So he said, look, you can be number one, but if you just have to do it. And he, in a club language, is called katui. You know, it, in Hokkien Chinese, it's called kiasu. The word, Chinese word kiasu is now in the Oxford Dictionary. Yeah? It means hate to lose. Mm -hmm. But katui means burning desire to win. And so over time, I must say I was inspired by this lady called Tracy Goss. I've never met her. She wrote a book many years ago called uh, The Last Word on Power. If you, you can still buy it. I, I warn you, it's the most boring book you'll ever read. <laughs> but it's a very, very heavy duty book. Because that book teaches you about dying before the fight. That means you are dead. A samurai fighter is a very dangerous fighter and he will win it because he's already dead before the fight. That is the ultimate way to conquer the fear of failure. And so I, I've always believed that until and unless you really stepped out into this totally uncomfortable position, I don't think you will go out there really, really transform yourself. 
And if you want other people to transform, you're not going to transform yourself. You're never going to call yourself a transformational leader. You must begin by saying, meaning to say that if you are this today, after you took the journey, you look a completely different person. That's, that's transformation. The people that work with you, they say, my God, I do not see, I don't recognize this guy anymore. Because he's now a different being from the one I have seen before. And so, returning back to the point, there was a question you raised about failures. Huh? I have many failures in my life. But like Jack, Jack Ma, you know, he applied to go to Harvard, I think, 13 times and never got into. I'll tell you one. And I thought I was really humble when I was in Sri Lanka. Because we had monopoly uh, over selling LPG. They control the, sell, the, the selling price for cooking gas. When we negotiated the price increase, they told me, look, Idris, you guys in Shell in Sri Lanka, was originally owned by a government company, we have 13 kg cylinders of gas, but we were filling it to the brim, 13 kg. That's actually not safe. The international standard is that you have to do it at 12.5 kg instead of 13 kg to allow room for expansion, allege. So they then said to me, look, we are the government, we allow you to lower the content to 12.5 to fulfill the international safety standard. That's equivalent of your price increase. But you must never tell the public that this is a price increase. This is a gray issue. I said it was justifiable from a, uh, from a safety standpoint. The government has given me the black and white, but they said you cannot tell the public it is a price increase because election is forthcoming. My God, we were discovered. It was a huge problem for me personally. It was a, a very big lesson for me in terms of, remember I told you about the litmus test? If it got found out, are you okay? I never asked the litmus test to myself. That's why I said okay. So when it was out there, that's why on the front page of the Sunday Leader, the lie within Shell, it was very bad. It's really bad. When you're on a leadership role and your credibility is on the line, you really have it very hard. It took me a long time to recover from that, actually. Very, very difficult. So I, I tell you that one because it is one of those reasons why I nearly left. It was so bad for me at that point. It took me nearly two years to recover from it. Idris, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you. I think your last, your last example um, really underscores the importance that you give to reflecting, yeah, yeah. reflecting on your leadership, reflecting on what you've learned. Yeah. And it also illustrates to us where your lessons of transformational leadership come from. Yeah. They come from a lifetime of leading, learning, failing, reflecting, adding to your wisdom in that way. And for that, we're all truly grateful to you. So thank you hugely. Thank you. Thank you.